Okay, so, uh, yeah, thank you again to Teresa for running through uh, API design for front-end engineers such as myself. Uh, it's useful to get a little historical context uh, regarding hypertext transfer protocol uh, because in the early mid-90s there was actually some contention, there was tension between different camps around whether you should extend HTTP at all because originally as part of the version 0 0.9 draft, it was just a human readable server client protocol to serve documents. You could get a document, you would receive HTML, that is all that it could do. So, like for example, this would be a 0 0.9 request, you would receive, uh, or you would ask for uh, electron positron pairs, for example, which is just a document name, you couldn't have any paths, just a name, one single word, and you would receive HTML. And if that document didn't exist, then you would also receive HTML. And it was up to you as the end user to work out whether you would receive a document or an error message of some form. So of course, this was not ideal. Uh, and it took a few years to get a 1.0 standard put together, but it added a whole lot of things. So it added error codes, it added verbs, you could now not just get a document, you could post attachments to documents, you could put updates to documents, you could have different types of documents served uh, or accepted, you could have arbitrary request bodies. So if you've ever dealt with HTTP over like direct communication over Telnet, this will look a lot more familiar. So you get a path with a version number, you can provide your own headers, and then the response will have its own headers, and most importantly, the first line of the header is a code, which will allow you to programmatically determine that whether you received a document or, for example, a 404 file not found error. So that's obviously a lot more familiar and a lot more extensible, a lot more usable. And another thing that was happening around this time in the mid-90s was the same kind of thing for email. So email was being extended, in this case, to allow for file attachments and various different document formats and various different document encodings. And it was thought, perhaps we could extend HTTP and merge the two together. So an example of that, uh, let's say it's 1993, you've been tasked to uh, build a newsletter sign-up form. And obviously the design is from 1993. It's nothing to do with my prowess as a UI designer, I guarantee. Uh, so there's three fields on the form. There's a sign up button. And that is the request that you would, the browser would send to the server. So very simple. You've got your request uh, fields there. And it's got a content type. It's got a content length. Uh, and that's all very simple, but a query or request comes down from on high. They would like you to be able to attach proof of ID when you sign up for the newsletter. I don't know why they want this, but it's a requirement from product. So if you were to design that, you might, for example, again, it's 1993. No one's ever done this before. You might use file transfer protocol, let's say. So you send the file over file transfer protocol, mm -hmm. you receive a file name from the server, you attach it to this form, and then you send the form. That sounds logical. That is, of course, not what browsers do. Instead, we've munged email and HTTP together, so the browser starts writing an email, and in the email, there's no body, there is in this case, four attachments, and each attachment is one of the fields in the form. And the whole thing is sent as like a one or two megabyte payload over to the HTTP server. And the HTTP server then has to read and understand the email to get the files out. So it was thought, because this is like 1995, 96 at this point, that now that we've we're ignoring file transfer protocol, we're sending files over email. Uh, what else is gonna happen? And this is a quote that came out of Netscape uh, 
Jamie Zielinski was writing Netscape Navigator at the time, and he had to deal with this. He had to write a browser that can send email. And it doesn't really make sense for a web browser to need to be able to send email, but that's what the standard says. So what else could happen? You could have air conditioning control over HTTP. It turns out that's now a thing, but at the time that was thought to be ludicrous. You could have in the 24th century, uh, you could have on the Starship Enterprise a transport protocol that is sent as a 400 terabyte file down to engineering to a HTTP server and maybe it gets cut off at the end and that's why Jean-Luc Picard has no hair. But that was codified in 1998 by Larry Massenter at Xerox Park at the time, now part of Adobe, of course. And what he wanted to do was write down some of these ridiculousnesses. And he came up with coffee pot control over hypertext. And as he says himself in the introduction, there is a serious purpose to this. It documents some of the inappropriate extensions and some of the ridiculousnesses that have been added. So an example of a hypertext coffee pot control protocol request with a couple of these ridiculousnesses. Uh, one of them being that in your protocol, you can just define any additional headers that you want. So in this case, uh, coffee pot control defined accept additions, which allows you to add stuff to your coffee. In this case, milk and whiskey. And another proposed extension was the safe header, which is where the client can tell the server that it will be able to resend a response if the client didn't acknowledge it. And first of all, that's TCP's job. That's not HTTP's job. The client doesn't acknowledge a response from the server in any way. And second of all, how would the client even know which request the response was for? So it was a half-baked extension at the time, but it's still an RFC. It's still documented. And Larry Massenter wanted to get that on paper as being ridiculous as well. So this is released April 1st, 1998. So obviously, it being an April Fool's RFC, there are some more traditional jokes in there, and there are some more technical jokes in there too. Like, for example, uh, what happens if you ask a teapot to brew coffee? All it will do is tell you, I'm a teapot, uh, and it won't give you any reference point. It won't tell you where you can go for tea. It won't tell you in which format it will accept requests. It just says, I'm a teapot. I'm not going to talk to you. So as a British Asian with cultural and genetic heritage in tea, this was personally offensive to me. And I came up with uh, a tea brewing extension to Coffee Pot Control Protocol, which was released in 2014. Uh, you're never going to see this in production. But just in case, here are some examples of how you would write a request to a teapot that talks the teapot brewing extensions. If you ask for a brew, uh, in this case with milk and two sugars, uh, it will not send you a 200, it will send you a 300 multiple options, and it will provide you with alternatives. If you want coffee, it will tell you where to go for coffee. If you want various types of tea, it will tell you where to go for tea. And in this case, I would like to have peppermint tea with milk and two sugars, and the RFC defines whether the teapot will accept your request. In this case, peppermint tea with milk and two sugars is forbidden. So you can't have that. So going back to the question that we had at the start, uh, inappropriate extensions of HTTP. Is there, well, is REST an inappropriate extension? And in my opinion, no. Because like, if, if you could take the original HTTP, it's receiving documents, it's posting updates to documents. It's getting a list of documents. And if you do that on database rows, you can map all of those things. You can get a particular database entry from a table. You can add new rows to the table. You can get a list of documents, which is just all of the rows in the table. So it maps its logical extension. And you may come across this argumentative, argumentative debate on various things not just 
uh, protocol specifications, but in your workplace, it's on design of various things. Uh, in the design document, you might find that the person who designed the technical implementation has gone about things one way, you disagree, you have argumentative debate, but it is important. Uh, we have a principle at my current workplace, disagree, then commit, which is that you can have this argumentative debate, but once it's been decided, you should commit to what has been decided. And if you have any further ideas, you can propose extensions and you can propose new versions. Uh, other questions I get asked now and again, are there any physical coffee pot control protocols? Uh, coffee pots? Uh, and the answer is no. I couldn't find any coffee pot control protocol coffee pots that actually talk the protocol. I could find a few teapots, but of course, again, all they have to do is say, I'm a teapot, go away. So that's not a very difficult, technically difficult project. But there is this, which is uh, a project from the University of Maryland Hackathon in 2018, I think. Uh, and that is the Hacked Together Coffee Pot Control Protocol Coffee Pot. And it won the prize for largest number of things in its tech stack, which I don't know if that's a prize that you want to win. Uh, and the other question that I get asked is, what's in this cup? Uh, what's my favorite cup? Uh, and I don't actually drink tea anymore. More of a black coffee guy. But uh, yeah, I mean, that is all I have for you today. I'm back again tomorrow on a different topic, but thank you very much.